a we a slap rat, son. He never, never bring. I bought it. Slap. <laughs> Let's go, man. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, what's going on? We are the two bright guys. I am DJ Composition. And I'm still the youngest of the OGs, a.k.a. Oh, that just G. Don't let me dispute it. Trey younger than me? Ah! He don't look like it. Where's the spoon? Where's the spoon? He don't look like it. He don't look like it. Where's the spoon? All right, man. Yeah. Anyway, I'm all right. All your, just, all your shit is out the window today. I be, I be <laughs> just G today, man. Finish the intro, man. Like I said, we are the two bright guys. We have a special guest with us today. The one and only world champion, four-time defensive player of the year, four-time all-star, businessman, and so much more, Ben Wallace. What's up, man? Thank you for kicking it with us, man. What's going on, man? Thanks for having me. All right, well, listen. Um, I know that me being a DJ music is such a big part of my life. I just want to jump right into it. If you had five albums... That would be the soundtrack of your life. Define your life. What would those five albums be? Oh man, that's tough. He <laughs> hit you with the five albums. You couldn't even give him the five, the top five artists. Probably. Listen, man, we gonna we gonna we gonna go can't. all over, man. Oh, can you name five albums? Oh, or uh, artists, or artists, whatever. Oh yeah, we well, let's do artists. Okay. okay. Uh, Scarface. Okay. Pop. All right. Big. Okay. Q. All right. DMX. Okay. And uh, and I got this backyard joint that I made that y'all got to check it out. All right. So what is it? Jew? <laughs> is it? <laughs> is it Jew? <laughs> is it Jew rapping? <laughs> no. The okay, bars. Okay. All right. I'm gonna say, man. I, all right. We put it in rotation. We all got some bars, but I got some bars, but they ain't mine. <laughs> But that's that's a unique list. Um, so is that like was that like a game day list that you had like you listened to before a game? Because those are all Pac, DMX, Scarface, Scarface, Big. Like that's a hype playlist. Yeah. See why you get on the rebounds now, man. Cube, Cube, Cube. yeah. Yeah. That's... Classics, man. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a unique list. I don't think I've ever heard anybody put DMX in their top five. And I think he's very no, bro. We do this a lot, man. A lot of people. We do don't... it a lot. We do it a lot. Uh, yeah, I mean. And yeah, I'm I'm with you. I, I'm a music rap connoisseur. I mean, D. If he would have kept his uh, if he would have kept himself together. Yeah, he would have been, you know, he was bigger probably, than Jay Z. Yeah, he was. Oh, yeah. It was a time where he was bigger than Jay Z. It's a lot of guys we wouldn't know him the way we know him today. Yeah, if he would have stayed on his game. I absolutely well, agree. Well, if that list, if if Pac and Big was alive and X was on his game alone. That covers three fourths of rap, <laughs> man. X was X was doing his thing right there next to Park and Big. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then I also feel like with uh, Scarface, he's one of my favorites, and he doesn't get the credit he deserves. And I think part of it is because he's from the South. From the South, and and it's funny because like my cousin like loves Scarface, so like. He was my bigger cousin, so all he was about face mob, like face, 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 ghetto boys, like all that. So. As a youngin, I knew about Scarface, and I was like, "Man, like this dude, he he, you know, he got bars and like this storytelling, and and even how he paint the pictures with the deck. I was always like, okay, Face is really dope, and we actually got a chance to meet him, so he was super yeah. cool yeah. when he came up here. So um, and then Cube, man, like we seen Cube too. Cube, I opened up for Cube. He was uh super cool, and I mean, I don't know if you could ask for a better career. As far as Ice Cube, if if you talking hip hop, like, okay, and then like the big three, and then mute movies and music and everything, like Cube is like that guy. Yeah, it's only it's only a select few few guys that can um, start off with a hot hot group, yeah, mm -hmm. and then go solo, yeah, very true, and have just as much success, if not more, or, or yeah. more, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's only a handful. So, yeah. so well, you were going, we were talking about the cars on the way up. And so I just want to know, how did you get into... Wireless Motorsports. Wireless Motorsports, look it up. But what's the correct term for it? Is it remote control cars? What are they called? Is this... Yeah, it's remote RC control. We call, we call them RC cars. How did you get into that, man? Like, how did you become a fan of that and become an owner of the company? And um, Well, I, I've always been into gadgets. Okay. You know, um, you know, even when I was in junior high school, you know, one of my hustles was you know, um, taking Walkmans, mm -hmm. 
you know, a lot of people ain't gonna know about the walk. The man. throwback, oh, no. yeah, yeah. Oh, we yeah. Know. We, we, oh, I know I'm the gonna, bus. My battery. How the hell you get it in your pocket, but yeah. <laughs> my battery been in my freezer a couple times. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Where yeah, the yeah. remote battery is at? <laughs> yeah. So I used to take Walkmans, and um, and I used to amp them up. Okay. You know, I took um, electronics in high school, so I'm gonna take you know a straight wire and connect a couple of the power resistance straight to the speaker. Okay. And killer sound. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to, and I used to charge guys like five dollars a piece to to amp they Walkman up. Okay. And you know, and, um, remote control cars I always love remote control cars. You know, I had the cars that you had to walk behind with the cable. With the cable, yeah. yeah. You know, and um, then I got the Radio Shack ones, the ones that'll go down the street a little bit, come back. Yeah. And then when I started playing in the league, you know, I I, I read about these uh, nitro power cars. Right. And um, and I used to talk about them all the time, and I used to get the magazines and stuff, but I never got one. And then for my birthday one year, my wife bought me one for my birthday. And it's been over, it's ever, over, since, it's over ever since. Ever since. I got, man, I got over 150 RC cars. That you own personally, that's that yours. I, that I personally own. Oh, wow. And, you know, then I was like, you know, I'm buying, you know, one of every car. So I might as well, you know, just get into business yeah. and, you know, start import and distributing cars. Okay. So now I import, you know, cars from a company called WRC and Infinity. Mm-hmm. And I, I import them and I sell them in the state. So, gotcha. so, so while this motorsport is, it's global. It's global. Global. It's global. So people check out Wallace Motorsports mm-hmm. Instagram, uh, www.wallacemotorsports.com. dot com. Because I know a lot of people are into those cars. I know people locally they like those cars, and and they did. I didn't know that they had a whole like. What's the international thing? Yeah, they have like championships all over the world. All like over it's the world. European uh uh racing championships and uh the the North American ones, and then the nitro was gas. Right. Correct. And then do you dabble with the electric ones electric as well? Also. Yep. And what a lot of people don't realize is um it's literally like legit car racing. Like you gotta worry about your suspension, the tires. I mean, like we was he was joking about the motors and the engines, like it's a seven hundred dollar motor, you, man. Yeah. You My first really, car was seven hundred You're really <laughs> engineering and running a race a race car team. Right. Anything that you can do to a NASCAR. You can do to this car. We can do to that car. I seen the pit crew. Yes. They got a pit crew video. It come, I mean, if I'm when I'm racing, I'm up on the driver's stand, and I'm racing, and I put my headset on, and my pit man got his headset on. So we're communicating the whole time. He's like, all right, Ben, you've been out for four and a half minutes. Pit. So I come around, come to the pit. He gas me up. I be like, yo, my car's pulling to the right. Take a little cam out the right. Take a little cam out the right. Wow. Put it back down. And we go. How fast do they go? Well, the 10 scale cars, you know, they get up to about 65, 70 miles an hour. The 8 scales get up to about 75, 80 miles an hour. And you control that like no problem? Like I, like no walls? No, no. How, how long did it take you to get good mm-hmm. at this? Um, I mean, it's just like, it's just like doing anything that you got a passion for. Okay. You know, the more you do it, the better you're going to get. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know, but I have been dealing with RC cars, you know, all my life. So my learning curve was a little bit different. Okay. You know, people were surprised to see me pick the pick up the controller and go out there and actually race. Most people, when they first get started, they pick up the control and they're good with just driving around the track. But, I mean, I'm, a, I'm, get a, after it. I'm a competitor, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I got like I got like five cars in the bag, so I go out there, and smash one, I just throw it in the back of the car. And, pull out another one. <laughs> and it's good so. to see a black owned company, man. When I went through the page, man, I was really um excited to see the black owned people competing. It was a lot of black guys in it, man. So how did are you the only black owner in this in the league or are there other black owners? Yeah, I'm basically the only black owner in the league as far as a distributor. Yeah, okay. And um, you know, that's one of the things we try to change, but it's just about bringing awareness to it. Okay. You know, everybody, you know, boys, girls, men, women. Yeah. Everybody love cars. Yeah. Right. You yeah. Know, yeah. Absolutely. Everybody deal with cars in one way or another. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And everybody that I introduce to it, 
everybody I took out to a race, yeah. and they actually got a chance to see it, mm -hmm. yeah. they was blown away. And they was hooked. They come back, they buying cars and stuff. Man. And so I'm like, I'm yeah, like yeah. so that's the hook. That's the hook. So if you come out there and check us out, I guarantee you'll be on Wallace Motorsports shopping. Oh, so, yeah, and so, I was already looking. I was already looking. <laughs> look, look, I got kids, so I'm already like, all right, kids, we uh Father's Day uh, birthday coming up. So, um, are they in Florida? The race is in Florida, right? I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, races all over. You know, the closest, yeah, the closest track here probably is Toledo. Okay. You know, we got Toledo. You know, we got Florida. We got Texas, Nebraska, California. You know, um, well, they got like a couple spots in California. So we all over the place. Okay. So with the, uh, I was watching some videos where they were hooking like GoPros up on the cars and stuff like that. Do you use that like as a game tape, so to speak? Like afterwards, to kind of review things. Do you do you race like looking from that point of view, or is it just strictly like I see the track and I'm just going like that? Yeah, you won't you won't need the glow the the GoPro. You know, people do that. They just trying to get a feel of how the car react on gotcha. certain turns and stuff like that. Okay. Because when you get on the driver stand, you're gonna be elevated like. 10 to 12 feet above the track. Oh, okay. So you can see the entire track. So do you right. get an advantage being so tall? Like, okay, I'm going to stand. Okay, I'm out my back. I don't want to go into no secrets. He looked no, at me, I'm all just, right, come on, man. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's just, yeah. it, it just like, well, the way basketball used to be. Yeah. You know, tall guys don't have an advantage in basketball anymore, but, you know, you, you, you use your height. You use what you got. Okay. Right. You know, so... I mean, they understand. <laughs> they ain't got no choice but to understand. Yeah. So, so in the in the racing series, like, is there like a series of uh of of tournaments and and then they go by points and and how have you fared so far? Like, have you won like championships or is it something that you got like a goal where it's like I want to win these many races or take home this like grand title or something? Is it something that you're looking forward to like getting for yourself too? Um, yeah, you know, the, the way the race is set up. You know, they, they set up just like, you know, just like um, NASCAR. NASCAR. Okay. Yeah. You know, um, we might do three qualifying runs. Got you. You know, first qualifying run is, you know, let's say if it's your first time time out there and uh, it's first time out there and the way the computer printed out is about when do you sign up. Okay. You know, if you sign up in the top ten, you're going to race in the top ten. Okay. So if me and you are in the same race and I'm considered a professional, you are amateur, you're gonna have to race that first race with me. Okay. But then the computer gonna break it down to who was in the second race that time was closest to mine. And then it'll separate everybody separate and it's themselves. Gonna separate everybody. Okay. And it's gonna put everybody in their own in their own race according to their skill level. Okay. Got you. Okay. So you just have that first qualifier where you might race somebody who's a complete pro. Okay. The next race they're gonna they're gonna separate you, where you can feel competitive, mm -hmm. and that way we don't deter anybody from being out there racing. Okay. I know when I'm out there, you know we got guys that been out there racing for thirty years. Wow. I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, I, I don't need to be in this race. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. I mean, but this year I got a chance to 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 race in the eight scale, you know, world championship we had, that was hosting. In California, so okay. we had drivers come from China, Japan, um, Italy, Thailand, Venezuela, Ohio, New Mexico, mm. and you know we we, we so it's a global, out. it's an international thing. It's an international, and thing. you're probably mm. shocking the people like yeah, next and lane six, Ben Wallace, they probably like, oh my god, man, like, <laughs> they they are because you know when you become a professional at anything, yeah, it, the way it's the way it go is. If it's a competition, I don't care what it is. As professional, you you want to win. Yeah, hell yeah. yeah. But people want to beat you. All they want to say is, "I beat Ben, ben Wallace." Wallace. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. They like what? Come on, yeah, we was in a race. They like, oh man, we talking about <laughs> basketball, but you know, they just want to beat you on anything. And for a lot of the guys, that's that's the highlight of their oh, year. life. Right. Yeah, like, I, I beat Ben Wallace. This and that. Blah blah blah. They'll say they beat me, and then they'll go to a company and be like, man, yeah, I, I out-qualified Ben Wallace, so I need a discount on my stuff. Wow. Like, what? So, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Wow, like man. 
So, That's crazy, man. I didn't know it was so competitive. I didn't know it was so deep, man. I'm, I'm glad that you gave us like a, a Cliff Notes version of it. I'm really going to catch a race now. But it's crazy because the top, what people don't know is the top drivers in this sport or in this hobby, you know, they call it a hobby, I call it a sport because yeah, it's right. international. Yeah. Right. And uh, the top drivers get an upward of, you know, $35,000 a year just drive these cars. Drive the car. You know what I mean? And that's better than a lot of jobs. Yeah, like. that's yeah. what I'm saying. Like, and that's just, you know, you're just catching a couple of races. You might only race. You, you fully sponsored. You get travel, hotels, cars, parts, um, a mechanic. A pit man, you don't have to touch your car. And they the lead, they might need to take care of you because you're gonna elevate the sport, man. Yes, we already have. It's, okay, it's, <laughs> right, it's, right. You already, already the conversation already yeah. happening. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. And, see, and, and that's a great segue because um, another wrinkle is that you're, you're part owner of the drive. So, I had a uh, seen your Instagram post, and you was like, "I'm making the transition from being a professional athlete to being a businessman." Right. So, how has that transition been for you, and what's been some of the things where it's like? Okay, some of these things are, are similar, so let me apply these strategies that I had from my playing days to the business world. Um, you know, when I first started the transition, man, it was terrifying. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, people look at your NBA career, your professional career, and be like, oh, he played 16 years. Oh, that's a long time. And he about to retire. No, I've been playing all my life. Yeah. Right. You know, I've been building up and training to get to this point. So I've been playing basketball all my life. Yeah. So once you leave that, you go from your safety zone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you just out in the world with the with the with the vultures. And yeah. now you gotta use your competitive, you gotta channel your competitive energy and try to put it into something else. Right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? When you play basketball, it was so physical. So, hey, if a guy fouled me, I'm gonna catch you and I'm gonna knock you on your ass. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but it's instant, if, instant repercussion. Yeah. yeah, business world's a little different. Business, if something ain't going right, you gotta figure it out. You gotta you gotta think it out. You know mm. what I'm saying? You can't lose your your temple or uh, nobody wanna deal with you. Yeah. So to start off, man, it was man, it was it was terrifying. I was, you know, I was literally walking into meeting. Hands sweating and stuff like that. Can't keep stop popping my knuckles and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. So, but you know, um, Steve, Steve Zabar, you know, he took me to a ton of meetings, and um, Trey took me to a ton of um, ton of meetings and stuff. And um, and then I started to learn. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, some people be so eager to they want to just jump in there and they just try to take over and lead the way when they don't know what the hell they're doing. Yeah. Right. So I just sit back and just listen and you know, and watch a little bit. So by the time it got to my time to step up and speak, you know, and, and talk about certain things, then I was cool and relaxed with it. But, you know, I got some good teachers, man. You know, the um, front office over there at the drive, you know, they do a great job of um, keeping me up up to date on everything and, and making sure that, you know, I'm where I need to be and um, put me in situations where I can be successful. Right. You know, it's feel like they want to see me su be successful. So... When you got good people around you, good things happen. Mm -hmm. how, how do you feel about, because you were undrafted, um, and I I, I kind of want to touch on like your upbringing a little bit later, but you were undrafted, and so now you see a lot of undrafted guys coming to your team. How does that, and I see a smile come to your face, man, because <laughs> I, I know most times people appreciate that grind differently. So how does that make you feel, man, now that you got an opportunity to give these undrafted guys a shot? Man, I love it. I love it. We talk about it all the time, and um People ask me about being um, an owner of a G League team. It was like, man, you've been wild as you know, your NBA championship, full time defensive player of the year, you know, all star, this and that, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, man, one of these NBA teams should have picked you up or whatever, whatever. I say, but that's not who I am. Yeah. You know, my personality fits yeah. the G League program. Yeah. Because if the G League would have been around, when I was coming up, yeah. I would have played in the G League. Yeah. And um and when it when it when the G League first came out, it was the D League. And I was still playing, but I was towards the end of my career. And, you know, I went to the um, to the league office and told them I want to purchase a team. And, you know, of course they wouldn't let me do it while I was playing. So 
But my thing is, here's my opportunity to give the next man an opportunity to keep his dreams alive. Right? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, basketball is like no other sports. Hoop dream die so hard. Man. Then it lasts so long, it will make you absolutely hate the game. When you wake up and you're about 50, like, wow, I hate I gave so much of my life to this game. Yeah. And get up tomorrow and go play it. And, and go play the game. Like, a, <laughs> right. lot, a lot of Just, people can't, like you said, it's an addiction. We joke about it, but like, I fiend for games too. Like, you, no matter what level you play, how you play, you. You kind of crave the game. So do you ever think about, because you still like you in good shape. Do you ever think about getting out there and showing your team, like, look here, man. Y'all not doing this right. Let me go ahead and lock the I, doors. Lock, it, lock these boys in here with the wolves. I mean, I think about it. But then, you know, I, I sort of sit back and, um, and, and and step away from and pull myself back out of it. Because once you cross that line. Yeah. It's hard to come back. Right. You know what I'm saying? And now I gotta be able to verbally show these guys yeah. the picture that I have in my head. Yeah. Because even if I go out there and try and do it physically, it might not turn out right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it might not turn right, right. You know, right. Yeah. I know I used to be that dude that yeah. could go out there and do this, but it might not turn out right. Then it ain't no taking it back. Once it, you see it, you can't take the truth back. Right. There you go. Okay. So you got to verbally, you know, paint the picture and, you know, hope they get it. Okay. So switching gears, because you said you were in the gadgets and everything, and obviously with the RC sports and everything, um, you got to have a, a degree of being a car guy. So what what are your dream cars or what, what have been your favorite cars that you that you drove or that you had? Or that you worked on, or or had something like that. My my favorite car of all time. Well, I give you my two favorite cars of all time. Number one, the uh, ninety six Chevy Impala. Ooh, the you thug know. life, baby. You know the bubble I mean? boy. The big body. Yeah, man. You know the vet engine. You, you know can't what go I'm wrong with that one. You, 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 you have one it. of those. You have one. Absolutely. Of... Okay. Absolutely. What you do to it? Uh, I did. I know you did something to it. <laughs> I did a frame off. You know. Bolted out the engine. Every, I did everything. everything you <laughs> man, I need to see that thing. Man, this thing is it's burgundy wine. Man, it's unbelievable. What color the guts? Um, burgundy and um and gray. Okay. Charcoal gray. Okay. Oh man, that's where it's charcoal gray with the burgundy um trimmings in it and stuff like that. And um another car that I had that I loved to death was the the Ferrari Killer, the Ford GT. Okay. Mm. Man. That car, man, that's <laughs> <laughs> the Ferrari killer. You just had the a Ferrari flashback. Killer. I just yeah, seen it. Is that the car in the movie? Huh? Is that a car in the movie? Ferrari versus Ford? Is that yeah, the okay? The, no, in the in the in the Lamar's race. Okay, yeah. yes. You know, Ferrari, Ferrari was winning, Ferrari was winning, and Ford say, we gotta build a car mm -hmm. to beat the Ferrari. Yeah. And they put three Ford GTs in the race and they finished first, second, and third. And that comes full Kick circle for you because That's what happened. Yeah, you playing at Detroit and all. Did you get that car while you in Detroit? Yes, I did. Oh, I, man. I got both of them while I was in Detroit. You got two. Well, I got I got I got the Ford GT while I was here. And and my guy, one of my one of my partners knew I was a big car dude. And one of his partners was a big car dude. So he was like, Oh man, this guy got your dream car over there. <laughs> so I was like, for real? He was like, Yeah, we gotta go see it. So we went and checked it out. And um, and we was just talking casually, talking. And um, I was like, "If you would let this car go, what you'll let it go for?" He said, "It ain't about the price. It's the memory. It's about who who gonna take it. who gonna take it. I'm gonna sell this car too." He said, "I won't just sell it for anybody. I don't care what the price is. But I, if somebody I know gonna take care of it, he said I might be persuaded to sell it." So we made a deal right there. So yeah, right. I trust you. You wouldn't let that one go. I wouldn't let that one go. <laughs> How often do you drive them? Um, Cause I know you're busy, so. You know, I, I, the Ford GT, I wasn't doing it, no, no, no justice, no service. I wasn't, I wasn't treating it right because 
I wasn't driving it enough. Okay. And every time I go to, you know, start it up, it might might start, might not start, have to mm-hmm. jump the battery or whatever. You know, the computer be down, you know, have to drive about 30, 40 miles to get the computer to come back up or take it to the shop and let them re, you know. Reboot it, yeah. Let them charge you for nothing. Right, yeah, charge you real. <laughs> so, so I got rid of the Ford GT, but the Impala, it's still at the house in the garage. I don't care if I don't never drive it. It ain't, it ain't going, going nowhere. nowhere. Yeah. Ain't going nowhere. <laughs> and all with that, all you got to do is just jump the battery if need be. Yes, and it's going to get right back up. Right there. Mm. Yeah, because uh, I, I, Comp is a big car, guys. I knew. Like, he got certain questions I know he's going to ask. And, and see, I-, I got a 70 Chevelle. So I had a similar situation because I lived on the east side of the state, too. And um, guy had a situation where he was a big fisherman. And a roof needed to be done. And, like, he put it in the auto trader like a little. It was a whack-ass picture, too. Like, one of those pictures, you're like, this ain't real. He don't want to sell it. Like, this ain't real. Yeah. So I, I called him, went out there, and I seen the car. He opened the garage. It was like one of those movie scenes. I'm like, like, is this for real? Like, you playing, right? So I gave him I gave him some money right front. I said, I'll be back with a certified check tomorrow because it was late in the day. So I gave him the money, and, like, we sat in this kitchen for, like, three hours, and he was just telling me everything about the car. I'm the third uh, owner, it was an original car. Got it's a Michigan car, so like I got the original dealership paperwork and everything. Wow. So um, he had did something to the uh, motor, repainted and stuff like that. But like that love for cars and those stories that's attached to it. Like for me, I say like it's not even my car no more. It's my son, and we going I'm going through the process of uh going fuel injected because I'm was, I'm gonna do the LS swap in it, and then my plan is for me and him to go cross country in it. Oh okay. And then when it's all said and done, I'm gonna. You get the keys. That's so. the keys. I don't think I'm. Well, my <laughs> my son just turned turned sixteen, and I got him one of the um, you know the, the, the uh, small Cadillac cars, and uh, and my daughter was like, "So, Dad, what type of car I get when I turn 16? She <laughs> she's thirteen. I say, I said, I don't know. I said, I don't know. You're a much better driver right now than your brother is. So <laughs> I said, so yeah. you know, we we it all depends. I said, depending on what he's driving at the time, you turned 13, you know what I mean? She was like, she was like, uh-uh, I want that Impala. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and for the first time in my life, <laughs> I had to tell her no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get that out your no, mind right not now. Gonna have <laughs> she was like, I'll get you another Impala before I take man. you this one. <laughs> she was like, she's like, she was like, why, Dad? Because you'll never drive it. Oh, I say. Man. So, you know, you got to try to smooth it out. You know, you got to tell a little lie that actually is the truth. Like, baby girl, that car's just way too fast, too fast for me. Right. Yeah. But, yeah, no, nah, she can't have it in Right. <laughs> <laughs> he already like, he nah. said the first time in his life you had to tell her no. Yeah, so, nah. so, no. I, but since, you know, you love cars, you need to um, check out the um, Gilmore Car Museum. Yep, yep. And, um, man... You know, I'm one of the. I'm on the board over there, okay. and it's unbelievable, dog. We did a walkthrough for the auto show, and I met Jay from the uh, from the museum. So I actually was gonna connect with him to get more of in depth walkthrough and kind of talk about the history and some of the cars and stuff like that. Because they had um they had the Hearst Oldsmobile uh pace car that was the station wagon that was the one on one. So I'm looking at the car. They got all the exotics. And I'm like, that's cool. But I'm looking at this muscle car. He telling the story like they just found it on the Humbug. Yeah. And I'm like, I see, that's dope to me. So I'm actually going to go out there. Me and Rich was already talking to him. About I, I think, didn't Rich shoot it already? Didn't you shoot in there before? Yeah, no, it's it's, it's pretty dope. I think yeah, it's one but, of the largest ones in the country, too. Yeah, and, and the crazy thing about it is, you know, one of the things that give me cheers is the fact that you know, they have open, we have open house okay. where you can come in and, and if you sign up, you know, as, as a member, mm-hmm. you actually get to drive whatever car that that they're um, showcasing at the time. Wow. Mm. I'll be in there, man. I'll I'm, I'm be in there like... <laughs> get in a candy like, store. Like, <laughs> you know, but I'll be for other people coming in. They be like, you want to drive this one? Oh, let's try this one. Come on, let's try this one. And I'd be like, you kind of scared, like yeah, yeah. I know, I know I can drive, and I'm gonna take care. Of it, but man, they be coming back, we'll be smelling that clutch burning. Man, I'd be in that. <laughs> oh, man. Like, man, why did you do that? <laughs> it's hurting you. It's hurting you. And they just 
jump out. They just turn the car off and jump out and go straight to the next one. And, and everybody be like, yeah, yeah, you can come on drive this one. I'll be like, oh, man, uh, yeah, it kind of hurt you. It kind of hurt you a little bit. Man, when you love cars, you like. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But. So I, I, got a, I got a quick question because, I'm like I said, he's going to go to cars. I'm always going to sports. Um, I read growing up that you were All-State linebacker and, and baseball. First, short question, what position did you play in baseball? Second. Second base. And All-State linebacker? Oh, did you have did you have any college offers? You had to have some offers for football. I had no offers for basketball because everybody assumed that I was going to play football. Mm. So no schools came. I had zero basketball scholarship offers coming out of high school. Because yeah, because you, you football, I can imagine you <laughs> in high school, man. I'm like that's your hands, man. Like, yeah. So yeah. so why 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 didn't you pick football? And if you would have, what school we would, would you would have uh, chosen? Um, if if I would have picked football, I was going to go to Auburn. Okay. Okay. But. I didn't pick football because my senior year, I pinched a nerve in my neck. Mm. And the doctor told me that, you know, I probably wasn't going to be able to play college football. Okay. You know, so then I just turned all my energy into basketball. Into like, basketball. I didn't really didn't. I always played basketball, but I, I never really cared about basketball because, you know, I was looking for my dreams in football. You okay. Know? So after I got hurt playing football, I was like, oh, I might as well take it serious. So... Basically, I had one serious year playing basketball, which was my senior year, and so I guess that wasn't good enough to to get the to get the scouts out there. Even though I probably averaged a triple double my senior year. Did you? Yeah. And then then you went to the junior college route, and then Virginia Union, right? And yeah. People people say junior college, but I keep I I I try to reiterate, you know. Junior college, yes, that's a two-year, yeah, you know, university or whatever. I didn't go to junior college. I went to a community college. A community college, yeah. And it's a huge difference. We played against some junior college, yeah, and was like, wow, this joke is it's all right. They yeah. come to us, they be like, man, this where y'all play at? Like, <laughs> this is it? This is it? Huh? <laughs> this is it? So, so you went, and then you, then you transferred, um, and then I read also that. Uh, is it Oakley was your mentor. How did that relationship come? Because he went to the school that you transferred to, correct? Right. Well, Charles Oakley is originally from Alabama to also. Okay. And Charles Oakley came to uh, Alabama to his hometown, and he held a basketball camp. Okay. And going in that summer, going into my junior, year, going into my senior year, my brother, you know, um, was a huge basketball fan. He read about he read about it in the papers. And he came to me and was like, you want to try this camp out? And I was like, sure, I'll do it. I ain't doing nothing else. And he was like, you know, maybe it'll help, help you get ready for, for the season. But I wasn't really into the basketball, but I went to the camp. So I went to the camp, and, you know, I just did what I did. You know, I rebound, block shots, catch the ball in the paint, dunk it, and, you know, everybody was raving like, wow, wow, wow. I'm like... This is what I do on the regular. Like that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like basketball players are soft. Of course, can't, they can't check me. Yeah, right. yeah. You know, I'm a football player. Of course. <laughs> I'm a football player. What do you think? <laughs> I'm a football so, player, yeah. So, so you know, Oakley. You probably yeah. right up his alley. Like, oh, yeah. That's yeah. So, you know, actually, me, me Oakley had, um, you know, we kids. So we come out um, after lunch. You know, they, don't, they wasn't giving us enough time to – to work that energy off. Yeah. So they started trying to teach. And, you know, we kids, we just ate, so we high energy. Yeah. Ain't nobody paying attention. Wanna blah, blah, blah. Oaks come in. You know, he all mad. Like, you know, y'all think y'all got this game all figured out. Y'all think y'all don't need to be here. Y'all think y'all that good. Y'all don't need to listen. I'll tell you what. One of y'all come out here and play me one-on-one. Then, of course, of course ain't nobody move. <laughs> <laughs> but it's... It's this girl sitting behind me, and she's pointing at me like this here. I look up and see her pointing at me. I'm like, <laughs> "Go right, somewhere." Put your, put, your, put your head down. <laughs> then he goes past me the ball. Oh, come on, come on. So I was like, "Okay, well, now if you gonna challenge me, now that's different." Yeah, it's right. different. You know what yeah. I'm, I'm not gonna challenge you, but if you are gonna challenge me, I'm not gonna back down. You know, especially when I got this young lady. <laughs> she believes in me. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, "All right, let's go." So we going, you know what I'm saying? He got the ball, drive to the basket, bam. Hold me in the lip, 
you know, split my joint. I'm like, dog, I'm like, that's how you play? He was like, play ball, man. Stop being punk. And then at the time, I'm walking up to check the ball up, and I look at the door, and my brother is coming through the door. And now my brother was was six seven, about two sixty, about three sixty five. Oh, so I'm like, oh, he like okay. He as soon as he walked through the door, I hear rubbing, and you know, besides my mom, he got the biggest hands ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he coming through the door. <laughs> <laughs> So he was like, so he come to the door, he was like, oh, okay, all right, go ahead and play, go ahead and play. So I'm like, hey, Now you got to, huh? Got to play, no. Yeah, you can't go home so, with this, yeah. So big bro come through there, we got to play. So I drive to the basket, bam, tap him, hit him in the mouth. So he's just going to bowl me in the face like that. Man, shut up, stop being a punk. <laughs> Give it right so, back. you know what I mean? You gave it to me, I took it, you know what I'm saying? Let's see if you could take it. And we, we battled with... Went went back and forth, back and forth, and um, and then afterwards he was like, "Where are you going to school at?" I said, "I don't know. I'm trying to get into Auburn." He was like, "Auburn ain't no basketball school." I said, "No, nah, I play football." He was like, he "Was like you don't play basketball?" I'm like, "No, nah, I don't play basketball. I'm, I play football." And then he was like, "He was like, okay, so after your senior year, if you want to, you know, make the change to basketball, or or you think you want to play basketball, here's my number." Give me a call. Wow. And a year later, I called that number, and he answered. Wow. So How'd that conversation go? I was like, hey, man, you know, I say, you know, my football career pretty much done. I'm trying to give basketball a shot. And, um, you know, you told me to give you a call if if I, if I needed some help. And he was like, okay. He was like, hold on, I'm going to hit my dude and uh, have him call you. And he called his man in 20 minutes. He called me. And was like, I'll give you, you know, full ride. Sight unseen. Sight unseen. Well, he saw me at the basketball camp. Okay, oh, he was. Okay, but he so hadn't seen me there. Gotcha. Okay. But you know, but that wasn't the the reason. You know, I mean, it, it could have been the reason, but he was like, if Charles Oakley said yeah. you could play, then yeah. you can play. Right. Okay. And then the same thing when I went to community college, Cuyahoga, for two years, then I got ready to transfer to Virginia Union. But before I went to Virginia Union, the craziest thing is I went to McNeese State. Okay. I signed with McNeese State, um, home of Joe Dumont. Yes. So, you know, they was always like, Joe coming, Joe coming, Joe coming, but Joe ain't never show up. <laughs> so, but they changed the rules and said if I didn't graduate from my community college, I was going to have one year of eligibility. I was going to have to sit out one year but the clock was going to be running. Yeah. And I was like, nah, man, I need two years to try to get done what I want to get done. So I called Oakley again, and um, I was like, man, I need to get in union. I'm trying to see see what's up. He was like, all right, let me call Dave. And he called uh, Coach Robbins at Virginia Union. Now, he's never seen me play. Okay. And he took me sight unseen. Wow. Because he said, he said, big fella, he said, I never seen you play. I don't know how big you are. I don't know if you can play or not. I asked Charles what type of player you you was, and say all he said was, "You need to take him. He's a grown ass man." <laughs> so he was like, he was like, so I had no problem with signing you, sight unseen, because everybody you ask Charles about, his first words are, "He's a bum. He's a bum." So he never co-signed or stamped anybody other than me. Wow. So, that's dope. Wow. And so, I, so I know you, I, that's like, and I've, I've never heard that story. You know, growing up in Michigan, following you your whole career, I've never heard that story, man. Yeah. So are you still in contact with Charles? You guys still talking? Oh, yeah, no doubt. Um, you know, we was uh, talking a couple months ago. And uh, matter of fact, when they, when they, when they drug him out of Madison Square, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> I mean, I I put it out there. I, I let him. I let it be known. I was like, I wish I was at that game. I wish I was at that game. They was like, man, what you talking about? I say, y'all have been dragging two big black men. <laughs> yeah, you know, it had been, it, it been a problem. Yeah, you know, I'm like, I, no, I'm still pissed off at the dude that was with him that would not hold his watch 
Yeah, when he well, tried to give him his watch. Him his yeah, watch. yeah. Like, I'm like, dude, take the take, watch. Take the watch. <laughs> take the watch. <laughs> take the watch. <laughs> he can take care of himself. Do. Yeah, that's all you got to do, man. The man can take care of himself. But I'm like, yeah, it was, and you know, it was. It's just an unfortunate situation. Yeah, it was. It's, it's a terrible situation. You know, it's, you know, it's hard to even talk about because yeah. I've been right there. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So you said because you had a passion for football. I mean, uh, I'm curious, who was your team that you had growing up? Like, you was like, that's my squad. How about them Cowboys? Oh, man. <laughs> cowboy on. So you ask questions you want to answer look, to. I, look, but you know, it's all good. It's all good. I can handle it. It's all good. That's I mean, but team. I'm a, I mean, it's an American team, but I'm a diehard Cowboy team. You know, you right. know with, you know, Tony Dossett, you know, Ed Too Tall Jones, you know, Danny White and all those guys. Like, yeah. you know, my first... Saw the football. I guess you can say it was a jersey. You yeah, know, right. was, was a Tony Dawson. Got you. So, yeah, you got I it. grew up a Raiders fan. So you know, right. it's, it's sorry to hear that. Huh? It's nah, like, it's it <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that, man. Hope you get pregnant. <laughs> it's all good. You know, you know what I say? Everybody can't be a Cowboys fan. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> so, so transition. So you you graduate or you leave Virginia Union and then you take the undrafted route. Right. Uh, what was your thought process going into that? Because I know, you, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you went overseas for a second too, correct? And then uh, you, you cracked into the league. So how was your transition, like going into the undrafted realm, and then like that overseas look? I mean, it was it was crazy because I always felt like you know I was I was looked over, even yeah. though football was was my passion. I wasn't no slouch on that basketball floor. Yeah, you know. They wasn't really keeping good records and, and stuff when I was in yeah. high school, but I can almost guarantee you that I averaged a triple double with with points, rebounds, and blocks. Man, and then I went to uh, community college, and I don't know what the school was looking for, but I was a monster there too. Yeah, because my our trainer introduced me to the weight room. Mm. So he told me, if you put on like 10, 15 pounds of just pure muscle, it's like, man, you'll be a straight monster. And I already felt like I was a monster. Yeah. So I was like, okay. I was in Cleveland for the um, for the summer anyway, so I was like, all right, I'll work out with you. Yeah. So we worked out for three months. Then, um, then I went home for a couple of weeks. And when I got home, everybody was just staring at me like, <laughs> like, oh my God. Like, what have you, you been doing? And I'm looking like, what? Like, what? Yeah. You know, and the crazy thing about working out, when the when your first time working out, you're the last one to notice the change. Yeah. But everybody was like, oh, like, man, you a grown man now. I'm like, man, what are you talking about? Like, I'm just trying to fit in. Everybody yeah. just looking like, like, nah. And then we would go to the playground and play. And guys would be like, man, I ain't going him. I ain't going him. <laughs> so, so I'm like, I'm like, okay. And so I come back to Cleveland and my sophomore year, I destroyed the league. But still, I ain't really got no no takers. You know, yeah. I got I got a couple school calling, but I'm like, I feel like every school should have been calling. Yeah. So I go to Virginia Union. And when I graduated from Virginia Union, and Virginia Union is a Division II school, yeah. I still, when you compare my numbers to the D1 players, I still led the nation in rebounds and blocks. Mm. And, you know, a couple of scouts came to see me. I know the Bulls came, and Sacramento came, you know, Washington came a couple of times. And, but I was just like, don't take us. Yeah. So I was like, okay. So going undrafted, I had a couple of teams call me and said that it was a chance that they would take me late second round if I was available. And I'm like, come on, man, you don't be available. But they didn't. Yeah. So I ended up getting a tryout with Boston. Okay. And you know, when they split you up for workouts, bigs down here, guards down here. So I goes down with the bigs. And the coaches come and get me, was like, what are you doing down here? I was like, I'm about to work out, get ready to try for this team. It was like, these are the bigs. 
you're a guard. I was like, no way. They was like, what position do you think you're going to play? I say four to five. They got together and laughed. Say, Not in this league, son. You're way too small. Wow. So they sent me to work out with the guards. I made their summer league team as a three. Mm. Because, I mean, I was I was just that determined that, you know, this is what I want to do. So you put me down there with the guards. It ain't my fault. Yeah. You right. know, these, you know, these little guards, I'm just gonna bully them and have my weight. Have my- <laughs> so that's what I did. But, you know, but they uh after summer league, they they cut me, they released me. And I got a call from a team over in in Italy. I was like, I'm gonna go over here, man, get this thing a shot. I said, this is NBA. I said, this this ain't my thing. This ain't my thing. I can't I can't work out at, at the guard spot. I say they're using me for a practice dummy. Yeah. I say they might have one or two guys that they're looking at and got everybody else just working them out. So I went over to Italy, get over there. I'm over there on payday. Everybody getting paid cash and checks except for me. I'm like, yo, what? <laughs> what my check? Yeah. I was like, oh, 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 we can get your check, get your check. So after a while, I was just like, man, I'm about to leave. And I called home, and I was talking to my dude, and they was like, man, well, if you come here, you're just going to sit here, and all you're going to be doing is working out, and, you know, this, that, and third. He was like, well, at least there, like, you ain't getting paid, but, you know, you got free meals, free room and boards, and a ride. Yeah. I was like, I was like, okay, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. So, were you getting some time? Were you playing there there too? Starting. Starting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> starting. Averaging. My I was averaging like like 16 points, 15 rebounds, like three blocks. Mm. You know, but the but the, the the crazy thing about overseas, sometimes they got all they it's a certain body type or certain looking player that they're looking for. And I just in in, in my situation, I, I just wasn't wasn't tall enough. And they, they but they still playing you. And I I know I have a cousin who uh, he played in Europe for a long time. He went to Michigan State. He's Izzo's very first recruit. All that he played in Europe, and he would say that like they'll if you're a guard or you if you're a ball handler, they'll bring in two or three other guards, right. have them watch you play, or they'll play with your money sometimes. Mm-hmm. They'll, they'll play with the money. Yeah, they'll, they'll play with your money, act like they don't know what's going on and stuff like that. So I didn't – that's another story I didn't know. So you finished the season there. No, then, I did, no, I didn't finish the season. I was over there for like like a month, and then I get a call from um, from the Bullets. Okay. Um, the first guy called me was um, was Chuck Douglas, was a um, Washington Bullets scout. And he was like, he was like, man, he wants you to come back um, – to Washington and, and try out for the team. I said, Chuck, last NBA team I tried out for, they put me at the guard. I said, I'm not coming back there to be nobody to practice dummy. So the next call I got was Wes Unsell. I turned wow. Chuck down. Wes Unsell called me. I turned him down. I said, Wes, I'm not playing the guard spot. You know what I'm saying? And were they offering you the two, like the three, four position? No, Wes say guard was like, who, who got you playing guard? He said, you can't dribble, shoot. <laughs> or pass. He was like, <laughs> it was like, what idiot got you playing guard? I'm like, man. I say that's where I was when I when I worked out for my first workout with with the Celtics. He was like, nah. He was like, I don't. He said, I don't need no shooter. I don't need nobody to shoot, nobody to score, nobody to pass. I need somebody to play defense, rebound the ball, and ain't afraid to knock somebody on the ass. I said, I'm your guy. So I came back, worked out. After three days of working out which was supposed to be like a five- or six-day count. After three days of working out, you know, Wes called me to the side and say, uh, go home. And I was like, man, I thought I had like another two, three days. He said, no, nah, go home and get the rest of your stuff. You come into camp with us. Mm-hmm. So went home, got the rest of my stuff, went to camp. We get to camp. We still got like five guys competing for like one, two, maybe two roster spots. You know, they got 12 guaranteed contracts mm-hmm. and 14 guys on the team. Mm. So it was like, you know, if you want it, you got to go get it. 
I say if you if you serious about the best man gonna take it, and I ain't gonna have to run into no politics because somebody owes somebody a favor, I'm gonna go after it. And he was like, nobody owes nobody nothing here. So I went after that spot. Relentless. The rest is here. And so was it like uh, preseason games you had to play and all that stuff or Yeah, I had to go through training camp and you know, I'm in we in training camp. We got uh Jawan Howard, 6'10", C. Webb, 6'9". He say 6'9". He's 6'10". George Mira's son, 7'5". Wow. Lorenzo Williams, 7 feet. You know, Al Straffamaya, 6'9". And and then here you go me at 6'7 and a half, 6'8". And I remember I walked in the gym because the veteran wasn't there while we was while we was working out. And, you know, they was telling the story. Like, man, he got this guy up in here, man. He rebound, block shots, man. He a monster. And the first guy that came early to see what type of player I was was Calvin Chaney. And he came in there, Joe. He sized me up. He's talking about, man, you're not even taller than me. <laughs> what that mean? <laughs> so we get out there. We balling. You know, he drives to the basket. You know, I block a shot a couple times. You know, and... Uh, Dunk on him a couple of times. Then the next guy come in to check me out was um, George Mirasan. Mm. George Mirasan walked on the floor and was like, in, 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 in his voice, who's this guy you talk about? <laughs> <laughs> so, who's this round, this round bound rebound you talk about? And he, and he said, like, there you go right there. He said, this little guy, <laughs> this little guy, bring me the ball, bring me the ball. So he get the ball, turn, try to shoot a, jumper, a turn around jumper, and I threw that mug down there out the window. <laughs> <And, you> know, <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know me. So he get mad. Me and him had some words, and um, I mean I, he wasn't really mad, so he was just messing with me. But you know, at the time I'm on the grind, so you know I don't want to hear nothing from nobody. Let's just play basketball. And, you know, he was talking about what he'll do. And I told him, I'll push that button on your chin. <laughs> <I'm sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, he, he held, <laughs> so he held on to that joint the entire day. And after we was finished, we hit the shower, get out of the shower and get dressed. And I'm walking out the locker room. And he tapped me on the shoulder and say, what is this button you talk about? <laughs> 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 Say, man, I was about to knock your big ass out. <laughs> You'll but, find out fast. Yeah, but you know, Jaw is a good guy, man. One of them, one of my good friends, real funny dude. You know, I, I never expect that coming from him. Yeah. And then you know, C. Webb, Jawan, those guys came in was like, you know, trying to figure out who I was. So you know, I was I was doing my thing, but. You know, I had one already had one leg up on everybody because I already had been through training camp. Yeah. Our season already had started in Italy. Yeah. And I already had played like five or six games. Yeah. So I was in game shape. And they just walking off the streets. Yeah. yeah. So I was destroying them. I was running circles around them. They was like, yo, young fella, you got to slow down. You making everybody look <laughs> making <bad."> everybody. <laughs> I said, until those guys come out that that office and say, I got a contract. Y'all in trouble. Y'all got to get it. Wow. Y'all got to get it. So was the league everything you thought it was going to be once you got there? Not at first. Not at first. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't understand the politics, you know, that goes, that, that that followed the game. Okay. I didn't understand that it didn't care. My mentality was it don't matter how much you paying this guy. Yeah. If I'm owning him and doing my thing, I deserve to play, you know, because up until that point, you always taught, you know, the best man win. Right? Yeah. And I felt like that I was the best big on the team, but everybody else already had guaranteed contracts. Big money, yeah. So I'm talking about big money. See, Webb had a max deal. Jawan was the first $100 million players in the league. Yeah. You know, and, you know, everybody else was signed. So it was like, it was easy for them not, not to play me. Because I didn't even have a guaranteed contract. They can say, okay, well, you don't want to deal with it, then you can go. You can leave. Mm. But you can't tell the rest of the guys that because they got guaranteed contract. You have to pay them millions yeah. if they walked off. So I didn't understand it at first. But 
once I figured it out, you know, I, I was I was cool with it, but I I never put myself in a position where somebody else can walk in the gym and thought they would and and, and think that they was better than me. Better than you. So they I, knew deep down. Yeah, yeah, it was. And even when we had camp, you know, guys be like, "All right, Ben, you take it easy, nice and nah, man. These guys out here working, you know, it's next man up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I I ain't looking over my shoulder. I'm looking ahead. I'm I'm I'm, I'm keep going. I'm gonna keep striving. And so I kept playing. And so, and I, I, I don't, right. okay, so, um, and then so we kind of transition, speed up, you get to Detroit. So you, you get traded for the man in Detroit, right? And so you come to Detroit. How did you feel about getting traded to Detroit? Oh, man. Because it's, it's kind of full circle because you come from Orlando, the Magics, who are owned by a team, the, the, the family from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Yep. And you get traded to Detroit for. It was crazy, man, because, you know, after my, my third year in Washington, I just had to start to find my stride. Yeah. I felt like the team, you know, the guys had started to appreciate me. You know, the uh, organization had started to appreciate me, and the fans definitely had my back a thousand. Mm. And going into my fourth season, we had a new coach coming in, and um, that summer he called me to his office for a meeting and told me, I want you to lead this team. Mm. You know, I want you to lead this team. The guys respect you. You bring it every day. You know I mean you don't it, you you're no excuse type player and this is the type of leader that we need on this team. And I was like, all right. Went home, went to bed, woke up that next day, was like I'm about to go run down to uh, Richmond, back down to Virginia, you know, tell everybody that Dude just made me team captain. I'm on my way. Mm -hmm. I'm on the ride <laughs> to Virginia. I get a call from one of my dudes. Was like, like man, why you ain't tell me they was about to trade you to Orlando? I said, what? <laughs> it's like, yeah. He's he like, man. I'm like, I ain't know nothing about it. He was like, man, you know you was up there the whole time. I was like, I ain't know nothing. So I get, I get off the phone with him. Call West Unsell. West Unsell was like, you know. uh, it was a hard decision. We really didn't want to do it, but we we needed a, a offensive center. I said, and what is an offensive center? You know, somebody who can score the ball in the paint. I was like, oh, okay. So you kind of understood a little bit? No, I no. didn't. No, <laughs> um, And the trade was for, um, for Samina Washington and uh, Ike Austin come to uh, – sent me to Orlando, Ike Austin come to Washington. So I go to Orlando. No, I don't know who Ike Austin is. I'm trying to mention. I'm trying to mention. I'm like, I don't. Know. This is do funny. your Google, son. Yeah, yeah. Do your Googles. I Everybody mean, gonna watch this. Like, man, who who was Ike Austin? Who? <laughs> who? But it. I mean, but it was crazy because I knew Ike Austin personally. Oh. Because Ike and I worked out together in Boston. Oh, wow. and Ike wanted to be a guard, and I wanted to be a big. Oh, okay. So they would put him in the paint, and he would try to play like a guard in the paint. I was on the perimeter playing like a big. How tall is so he? So he's about six ten. So I'm like, man, we need we need to switch spots. And just so happened, we did end up switching spots. spots. <laughs> <laughs> you got traded so, for each other. So I go to Orlando, and it's Doc Ribble's first year as um, head coach, you know, it's his rookie season as a head coach. And he tell everybody, don't nobody have a job. All spots are open. Best man, going to get it. Mm. And we all had similar contracts, so wasn't no politics in that. So I was like, I was like, let's get it. And on that team we had, it was um, me, Darrell Armstrong, Bo Outlaw, three Undrafted, undrafted players, yeah, mm -hmm. that end up starting at the one, three, and five spot. Now, politics did get involved with that team because I think they was trying to get a couple of draft pick, so yeah. I think they was tanking. But had they let us go, we would have had the league on lock. Yeah, it wasn't no tanking. It, it, it wasn't. I mean, you couldn't handle the ball around Daryl. You know, 
Bo Outlaw was a dog. I was down in the paint, you know, handling my business, man. We was, and we was, between the three of us, we was the strongest, the fastest, the hungriest, you know, guys on the team. Mm. So we led that team, and, you know, that was my first start spot, and I thought I had found a home. Okay. Because the fans appreciate me, you know, the, the organization appreciate me constantly talking or whatever, whatever. And, you know, I become a free agent. So I'm like, I'm, I know I'm going to sign back with Orlando, so I ain't even looking ain't to look, yeah. You know, plus it's, it's summer year-round down there, too. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's cool. And Orlando decided they want to go another direction. So I'm like, okay. And they was like, we're going to do a sign and trade with Detroit. I'm going to send you and Chuck Atkins to Detroit for Grant Hill. And I was like, I was like, all right. Only thing I really knew about Detroit at the time was it get cold in Detroit. <laughs> it get cold. Because you was in Ohio, say, so you know it get cold I in the D. I know it get cold in the D. Yeah. I'm like, man, it get cold in the D. But that trade went down as the most one-sided trade in NBA history. And, you know, people was talking about it. You know, we'll trade Grant Hill for, for who? Ben Wallace and who? Chuck Atkins. Like, man, nobody even know those people. So I was like, that was good for me. That was good for me, Chuck. Because yeah. nobody knew us, but we knew what we was capable of doing. Right. So there's no expectation, no outside pressure. Just go out there and play. They think y'all bums anyway. Was it Joe Dumars that made the trade? Yeah, Joe. So, it was Joe Dumars rookie year as the president of Detroit. So when you were going, to, you were going to go to his college. Joe Dumars coming. Joe Dumars came. I had to finally meet him. I had to go to him and meet him though. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, me and Chucky was like the first deal that Joe did. Mm. And did you ever ask him like, uh, what what did he see in you, like, or was that a, a deal to get Grant out of there, or was it something like you were a piece that he needed too? You know, the crazy thing about it was when I was in Washington, and I was grinding trying to make that team or whatever, and I checked in the game, and Joe still was playing for the Pistons. I checked in, the Raw Strickland penetrate down the lane. And dump it off, and I'm ready to monster dunk this mug. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe Dumas sort of takes me out the air, grab me out the air, and, you know, pull me down or whatever. So I turned and looked at him, and, you know, I told him, like, hey, man, don't do that shit no more. I'm going to fuck you up. <laughs> <laughs> so so when, when he made the deal for me to come to Detroit, Detroit. They asked him, like, why Why you decided to go, you know, with this trade? And he said, because Ben Wallace is one of those type of guys that I want to hit you in your mouth before you have a chance to hit me in my mouth. Mm. And, you know, that that sums it up. Like, I got to hit you before you hit me. You know what I'm saying? So, but, but coming here was crazy, man. Like, it's the most one-sided deal. It's and that, blah, blah. They first announced me, Chuck it. The 19 fans that was at the gym was booing. It was, wow. it was, it was crazy. <laughs> it was crazy, but, you know, as we just went out there and just did our thing, you know, we both became fan favorites in Detroit because they appreciate, they appreciate the grind. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, kept going, kept going, kept building with the team, kept building. And, you know, finally we got ripped and Chauncey, drafted Tayshaun, you know, made that midseason trade for Sheed, you know, ended up winning the championship. And you know, I tell people to this day that trade still goes down as the most one sided trade in NBA history. Mm. But in my favorite this time. And your favorite. Right. And it, it's kinda it kinda caps off your story, man. Like you know, just from like football getting hurt. Uh you like you're gonna go to Auburn, then uh the basketball, the community college route. Then have then like you were gonna go to one college, go to another. You go to Italy, not get paid. Like it kinda caps off, man, that grind because you could have quit at any time. At any time. I talked about it today, you know, we spoke to some kids, you know, sort of like like at risk kids. Yeah. And, you know, that's basically what I told them. I was like, you know, like doubt. Doors closing in your face. You know, um, broken promise, missed opportunity. I said, man, all that stuff do is is uh lets you know that you're human. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? 
if everything works out in in the first guy that walked to the door favor, you're never gonna get an opportunity to go through that door. Mm. You know, if you're the 10th man in line and it's working out for everybody that's going through that door, you're never gonna get that opportunity. Yeah. So some people gonna that doubt is gonna creep in and it's gonna make them fold. But what doubt should do is make you step back, regather, and go harder the next time. Absolutely. That's the only way you can get stronger if you get knocked down. If you don't never get knocked down and you get on the other side of that door, and if you never went through any type of adversity, I don't want you on my team. Mm. Right. Whether it's basketball, whether it's in the business world, kickball, dodgeball, I don't want you on my team because you're going to get to the top and you're going to get disappointed and you're not going to know how to recover. You're not going to know how to come back because it's going to be your first setback and you're going to fold and you're going to crumble. It's just like the old saying when we say everything he got was given to him. Yeah. So we don't appreciate it. Yeah. You know, I'm like, I got my eyes out the dirt. Out the mud, man. So I know, I know how many times I had to hit the dirt in order to get back up. To get up. So like it just made you stronger. Doubt make you stronger. It make you regather, make you smarter, make you more focused, and it make you come a little harder. Yeah. Doubt ain't never supposed to make you give up. If it make you give up, this ain't meant for you. This ain't the business for you. Right. That's 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 perfectly put. I got a, I got a couple more basketball questions. Just like my dream. Uh, nah, interview, it's, man. it's okay. all good. It's all, all right. good. So, you know, I, I got a couple more questions. Yeah, yeah. But... I know. I know. We don't want to take up all your time, but I got a couple more questions, man. Um. So, first, how do you think you guys would have fared? I gotta ask this: If you drafted Carmelo. If we would have drafted Carmelo, I honestly don't think we would ever won a championship. Why is that? You think like the focal point would have been on him too much, or like as a as a high high value rookie, or Melo would have wanted to play right away. Okay, and the expectation of him would have been right there too. Right, right. so it would have had the potential to disrupt the team chemistry. Yeah. But by drafting Darko, Darko was the guy that came in and said, I can't play on this team. I'm not ready to play on this team. Who am I going to play in front of? I'm not ready. And by him doing that and accepting his role, it allowed us to build and grow, build and grow, get stronger, get stronger, and eventually win the championship. Win the championship. If he would have came in saying, I want to play, I need to be playing, now he would have called his agent. His agent would have been calling Joe. Darko would have been talking to the media. You know what I'm saying? The media would have been coming asking those crazy questions. And we would have had to say something crazy. They would have took it back to Darko. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? The whole divide and conquer, man. If yeah. Mello, if we would have drafted Mello, Tayshawn would have never – Blossom, you think? Blossom to be the type player that, that he yeah. became. You know what I mean? And we won the championship off the back of maybe one of the, well, not maybe, the best block that I yeah. ever seen in my life. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I blocked a lot of shots. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's the type of grit and grind that that team yeah. was about. That, that season, right. Chauncey hit that a the, big that three. Yep. That team. block. And I, but see, in my mind, I've always, I think we talked about this before, me and Comp, but I always hope that if you guys did drive Melo and he came in and bought in, it would have made him, oh, and he's, a, I think he's a great, it would have made him an even greater player because you guys had so, I, and I, I don't, I don't know if he would have or not, but that's just my dream, like, you know, but I, 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 I just assume that, you know, you were there, like, you, that's, that's the perfect way to, to, to put it because, like you said, Tayshawn, um, he went to Kentucky and all that stuff, but he came right in and he fit in. And like I said, that block, it can't be replaced, man. Can't be replaced. I, I know a lot of people in other cities oh. might say it's a goal. What would you say, Rich? Mm. Rich say Rich say it's a goal. <laughs> hey, I was there. He was right. man. Say it was there. It was a, it was a, it was a block. <laughs> so so now we I want to talk talk about the championship year, um, and then with the the tragic passing of Kobe Bryant, mm. um. You guys will forever go down as the team that kind of dismantled or you stopped 
that was their last game Shaq and Kobe ever playing together. Kobe, they recently had an interview with Kobe where he said uh, the reason that they lost was because they had a lot of discourse on their team. I don't know if you've seen that interview or not. I've seen the interview. Yeah, I've seen, yeah, yeah, I've seen, I've seen them all. Yeah, I've yeah, seen them all. And um, so kind of speak to that legacy as far as, like, how do you feel um, dismantling DJ Compositions Lakers? Um, it's crazy. Before I get to that part, back to the the, the, the mellow, draft the yeah. mellow. It wouldn't have worked because Larry Brown was the coach. Okay. And Larry Brown wasn't one to to uh, play rookies right away. Right. Okay. So that would have caused some tension between him and Larry Brown. Off oh, real. Off just 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 straight off the word with his, with his right. second pick. Day. With his pick, second yeah. pick, we take Carmelo Anthony. That yeah. would have caused some riff right there. But you know, back to the back to the Lakers. Man, you got to What you got to understand is that team, those guys in that locker room that I played with on that champion team, are just as close. Or even closer than me and my biological brother. Mm. So when they say that they had some um, internal issues going on that cost them that championship, yeah, I wouldn't buy it with your money. <laughs> it wouldn't matter. Huh? It wouldn't matter. You still got to win the game. And because if Not, Kobe don't hit that last second shot in LA, it's a game two, it's a sweep. It's, it's a sweep. It's a sweep. And I mean, and as a Laker fan, I will, and I lived in Detroit when y'all won it. So I knew the excitement and just y'all changed the whole energy of the season that season. You yep. know, people would, I mean, like, a lot of people be down in the dumps in Detroit sometimes, man. But y'all gave folks hope and then just that that grind and that grit. But the spray paint. If he wouldn't, if he wouldn't have hit that shot, it would have get the brooms out. It would have been over. I mean, it, it's it's crazy because it's, it was a couple of things that happened in that, you know, down the stretch of that game that were just so, that just caught us so off guard. Even though we was prepared for any and everything. Yeah. Except for that change of event that caused Kobe to get that shot. Mm-hmm. Everybody know. Everybody in the world know if if uh, if Shaq catch the ball, you supposed to foul him. Yeah, right. So everybody in the world know that Shaq not supposed to catch the ball. Yeah. So when they inbound the ball to Shaq, everybody was like, "What the? What's going on?" And we just froze. And by the time we react, he was handing it off to Kobe. So Kobe came off, and. I mean, when once he did that, I knew the shot was going in. I, <laughs> I, said, I said, that's good, because everybody else, we all had stopped. We had yeah. came to a complete stop. The only time ever playing with that group of guys on defense, we froze. The mm. whole defense just rose up. And when he hit that shot, it was like, bam. And it sort of took something out of us, because we know we were supposed to win that game in regulation. Yeah. And they get it in overtime. But we walk in the locker room like, oh, well, like, one one, we got this. Like, we got, like yeah. it's good. Like it's cool. He was like, okay, well, see, I guess we're gonna celebrate. We're gonna have to celebrate in Detroit. And you know, we was in the locker room still excited. And and Larry Brown coming up was like, hey guys, calm down, calm down. Like it ain't over yet. We like, nah, we good, we good. Yeah. It was like, no, no, guys. I, I just want you to know that I've been in this position before. He said, I was coaching Philly and we won the first game. Yeah. And lost the second. So he was traumatized. Yeah. <laughs> so so he's telling us this story, and like clockwork, everybody on the team go, LB, this ain't the same team. <laughs> yeah, like, man, right. go ahead. Man, we got this. Like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Don't even worry about it. We got that. He just threw his hands up and walked out the locker room, but we never had doubt never crept in our mind. You know, so, so winning that championship, um, did you did you did you think, okay, we got this one? Um, we going to get some more. Like, we we, we got to get some more. I was looking for at least three. At least three. I was looking for I at mean, least three. Well, you I got was killing it. I'm, 
Oh, yeah, no, even but, the Eastern Conference Finals and all that stuff, you were going back to back to back all the time. Um, but you would you were thinking at least three. I was thinking at least three. But here's what you got to understand. Other team around the league was picking our team apart. Yeah. Right. They was they were stealing all our bench players. Mm-hmm. They was offering them deals that they could not turn down. Yeah. Right. So they picked that team apart and we still had that core group together, and we still were strong. We still were solid. But they picked out our bench, and that's how they that's how they broke us down. Mm-hmm. Is they, they broke our bench up. And you guys kind of changed the NBA because, like you said, like in today's game, you playing the four and the five, is it would be normal. You were beating Shaq down the court. You know what I mean? You had high energy. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was kind of, I won't say the starter small ball because she is like, what, 6'10", maybe? He's seven. Feet. He's seven foot. Yeah, he's seven foot. But he was still shooting that jumper. Yeah, he'll say six six ten, but he's seven. Feet. He was shooting that jumper. Um, and you guys had all the pieces that what people have now. Cause I I our kind of fashion, um, a Draymond, you know what I mean? Like him coming up, growing up in Michigan, mm-hmm. and what you See? did, it kind of opened that door for people like that, man. It's crazy. He was with us during that championship run. Cause you know, he went to school, him and um Joe Dumas' son, Jordan Dumas, they yeah. went to school. Yeah. So he was with us. Oh, around, around that team. Oh. Yeah. So he actually got a chance to be around us. Mm. So so he he was figuring it out then. Oh, so, so, so he kind of got a firsthand look, and that's that's critical for, for young kids coming up too. Um, and I, I kind of want to stay on the Kobe situation. I know it's a tragedy. Um, did you guys have a personal relationship or um I seen you posted a couple pictures on your Instagram. I know that it's a mutual respect because um you did play Shaq and, and Kobe are Hall of Famers, Carl Malone's Hall of Famer. Gary Payton, like you, you really dismantled, <laughs> like really the super friends, you the, know what I mean? Or like, or like them in their face, yeah. The, like the, the so called that that was like the first super team. Yes. When you look at it on paper, that was the first super team. So when everybody started judging guys from leaving one place and going to another and trying to chase the championship, they got to look at that team first. Yeah. So, but the thing with with, with me and Kobe was our relationship was different. You know, even though we was cool. Or whatever, you know, we came in the league together, same year, ninety mm. six, and um, even though his career took off earlier than mine, yeah, you know, I was I had to sort of find my way. I had to find my niche, and I had to find me a home. He know he wanted to play in L A. Yeah, and he got there. Yeah, and he flourished there. Yeah, and the crazy thing about it, when Kobe first came into the league. I looked at a guy like like Eddie Jones and say, that's the type of player that Kobe's going to be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But he wasn't selling for that. For Eddie Jones, yeah. At age 17, he said he wanted to be the best player to ever touch the basketball. He wanted to be the greatest player to ever play the game. And he reached the level of greatness as far as basketball, he put himself in the argument with Michael Jordan. Now, you can say what you want. You can say Jordan is the best to ever do it, and I, 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 I will agree with you. But I say he put his name in the conversation. He's definitely in the conversation. Yes. And he said he would be at age 17. Yeah. This is a kid. He can't even legally sign a contract. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Right. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And he knew what he wanted to do. So when I found my way, I'm watching guys, you know, in my draft. I say in my draft, you know, I ain't get drafted. It's in that 96 class. Yeah. Which is and, loaded. And, and you part of that. And, and y'all. Which is, shit. Which is which crazy. Yeah. Because I'm watching these, I'm watching these guys, and the two guys that I got my eyes trained on the most is Kobe and AI. Yeah, like they leading this '96 class, even though we loaded. it. Yeah, and, and as an undrafted player, you know when I get to Detroit, now I'm at home. Yeah, and I start coming into my game. Yeah. Was make the class even stronger. Yeah. Because you got the the number one pick 
who's supposed to be doing it, living up to the expectation. Yeah. You got, you got Kobe, who said I'm gonna do it. Yeah. Put the pressure and the expectation on himself and living up to it. Yeah. And then you got me at the bottom, undrafted. Nobody know nothing about. Yeah. But I want everybody to know me. Yeah. I want everybody to know what I'm capable of doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm out here grinding. So when you look at that class, the year before we won the championship, it was, uh, or was it two years before, I'm watching Kobe and AI yeah, go AI, at it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, dog, oh, I want to get there. I want to be at and that, that yeah. level. I want to be on that level. And then in order to win a championship, we got to dis we got to dethrone the Lakers. Yeah. Like, all right, big fella, you say you want it, you got it. Sometimes you got to be careful what you wish Nashville, for. Yeah. But we had a team that year, dog, that was that could have beat anybody. Yeah. Any team, any team that ever played the game, we had a chance. You know. We was in a situation where we was holding teams under 70 points. Right. Yeah. Because defense was your, was your calling card. That was it. Yeah. You going to have to earn every you bit You got to earn. You got to fight for every inch of the floor, and you got to earn it. And we're not double teaming nobody. I don't need no double team on Shaq. Yeah. I said I'm going to shut him down, but I'm going to make him work, 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 yeah. work. I'm not going to shut him down. I'm going to wear him down. Yeah. Right. And after he finished working, and we get that rebound, I'm sprinting to the other end. Now he got to chase me. Yeah. So we're going to drag. We're going to play Kobe straight up. Yeah. Now, Kobe going to get his number, but he got to work. But what that does is eliminates all the free shots for Derek Fisher. Yeah. You know, uh, um, Gary Payton, those warm-up threes that they were shooting. Yeah. When they double shack and he kick it out, and they, yeah. uh-uh, we're going to – Make sure everybody stay home, play everybody honest. And if they beat us like this, then they beat us. But they got to earn it. They got to earn, earn it. They got to earn it. Do you feel like they underestimated it. you guys a little bit, though, too? Oh, man, yeah, they been there. They they been had looked past. They was, I was, they, when Derrick Fisher hit that shot to beat the Spurs, yeah. oh, they already had the championship. Oh, uh, okay. Wrong. 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 <laughs> wrong, wrong, and wrong again. <laughs> but... When they said they had that inner turmoil going on, did it just happen when y'all played the Pistons? The, or was it not happening when y'all played the Spurs? Yeah. You know, y'all was strong enough to beat the Spurs. Right. You know? Yeah. So it just started happening when y'all played the Pistons? Yeah. Nah, man. Yeah. <laughs> nah, it was, we, we, was, we, was more, we was more prepared. They was pen, depending too heavily on Shaq and Kobe. You know, too, we... We 14 deep. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We, I mean, when you get past our starting five, we got Lindsey Hunter, Mike James, Corliss Lindsay Lindsey Williams. Hunter has, we call that when, when my cousin always says, when your woman putting pressure on you, that's that Lindsey Hunter D. That 94 feet. Yeah. People do not understand, man. That a great defensive guard, man. man you you know, had to earn everything with Lindsey Hunter. We had, and, and the way they play the game now where bigs have to be your scores and have to be able to shoot the, that Shoot jump, the trade yeah. ball. Free ball, yeah. We started that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We started that with, with she the Mimito core. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, Mimi, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. Man. What are you gonna do? You, yeah. It's like, you know what I mean? We got we got those guys. We got Eldon Campbell. We got Darvin Ham, Corley Williams, you know, Lindsey Honda, Memo Core coming off the bench. Yeah. So Mike James, Lindsey Hunter, like dude. Mike you, James too, yeah. Like we, we we were strapped. Yeah, yeah, had a good all, team. All dogs. We all dogs. Yeah, 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 all dogs, man. And that and that's that's a great testament again, man. It's all full circle. So now I got one more question, and I will let you. It's I, all I, good. I, I know it's Mr. Wallace got to go. The malice at the palace. I I just like what was going through your head at that moment, like, because I I know like you said you didn't take no crap from nobody, and and we all know that uh, our test can be a little off sometimes. Like what was going through your mind, like when they like they were going to the crowd and stuff like that? Like it's just, 
I mean, it was it was it was it was crazy. It was like having an out of body experience, man. It was like because he didn't come to you. Like he wouldn't lay down when he was when he came to you. That's what I said. You know, that's that's one of the things I still say to this day. Like he should have just fought me. We should have just you know what I'm saying. Whatever yeah. we had to do, we should have just did it. Right. Yeah, because. We threw a lot of threw away a lot of money that oh, night yeah. on suspensions and fines and millions. Millions, millions. And it's and it and it disrupt a great rival. Yeah. Between us and the papers pacers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We was able to bounce back. But the Pacers never recovered from that. Nope. Yeah. It dismantled their whole team after that. Yeah, I, I think Steven Jackson said in an interview it cost them $10 million. And um, he said that when they got in the locker room, um, Ron Artest asked, you think we're going to get in trouble for this? <laughs> <laughs> and they was like, get in trouble? Like, we're, we're, we're basically done. Man, they, like, be, Steven Jackson said he thought that they, they would never play in the NBA again. We'd be lucky if we play again. So, yeah. yeah, so it, I, I never understood why he – I mean, I understood why. He, like, when it was you, I'm going to go lay down. Somebody threw something, it's one of those moves. You crazy, you ain't that crazy. You know what I mean? So yeah. um, I always just wanted to ask, like, what was just the thought process behind it? Because I think it was, they said it was a payback file or something, right? From one one person to another? Yeah, I mean, it was it was a couple plays, a couple possessions earlier. You know, I blocked the shot, and he told the official that, I, you know, that my follow-through hit him in his head. And the official was like, man, y'all y'all got the game under control. Just, man, just play. You know, it was a good block. Just keep playing. And he was like, nah, he found me, but don't worry about it. I'm going to get him. So, I grew up, I'm 10 of 11 kids. If anybody in that house say, I'm going to get you, <laughs> they going to get you. Yeah. That means you might as well just go ahead and, and scrap right there. Yeah. Because if you turn your back at one point in time, they, it's going to be a fight. They're going to get you. Yeah. So, ain't no need of walking away from it. Just go ahead, square up, and get it done. So that's why I say I was so like, yo, you can get me now. You know what I'm saying? Let's just go get this thing out of the way. Because the game is pretty much decided. Right. Yeah, y'all y'all got to win. Yeah. You know? And, you know, then when he fouled me, you know me, I was like, yeah, I'm like, I'm very unnecessary. I'm like, that's just unnecessary. Yeah. So, you know, I he did what he said he was going to do, and I did what I was taught to do. Yeah. So that's what it is. And that, okay, all right. So we we talked about talked about the life of basketball. We talked about the grind and just the the the, the determination to getting what you want to get out of life. Um, the RC Motorsports. We talked about music. We talked about everything. When it's all said and done, like you've lived a life that like people can look back and be like, "Damn!" Like it's he, a movie. It's a movie. Like yeah. real talk. It's a movie. Coming soon. Coming yeah. soon. I mean, yeah, hey, it should. yeah. Who you gonna have play you? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Start thinking. Well, I got I to gotta, I gotta talk to my partner, Mary. She'll figure it out for me. <laughs> you like, hey, Rich, <laughs> what? Rich, you ain't tall enough, man. Uh, like, Rich. Rich. <laughs> I was, man, no, I was camera angles. <laughs> uh, Rich, I was you height in sixth grade. <laughs> you, you know you know would it be a good person to play him? You ever seen uh, what's The Watchmen? The movie, the, it's the show The Watchmen. It's on uh, HBO. It's like the the comic book to watch. The guy played Dr. Manhattan? The guy that played Dr. Manhattan. He kind of favors you as a muscular guy, big guy. Look him up. I don't up. know if he's tall enough. He taller than Rich. We know that for well, sure. I mean, <laughs> but I was going to say is that um, if you could sum up what you would like your legacy to be, when it's all said and done, what would you, what would you want that to be? Because uh -huh. it's like you've done the basketball part, you've done the grit and grind and that life to get to that, and now it's like this is new chapters that you're writing and you inspiring people all over again. So when it's all said and done, what is it that you want to be like, boom? Um, I mean, at the end of the day, I, I guess I want my legacy to be about, you know, about my kids you know, about my family and about a guy who came up who was truly against all odds mm. but found a way 
to take something that he dreamed about and make it a reality. Mm. And not in the glorious way that the average player or average person has achieved their their dreams. Right. I didn't become a prolific offensive player. I became a prolific defensive player. Yeah. Right. So that's the hardest grind to be able to control the, a game from the defensive end of the floor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when my whole story from day one, from the day I was born, has been different. Yeah. You know, um, like we talking about a movie, I'm in the process of, you know, I'm, I'm writing a book and I'm telling, Dope. I'm telling my story, my mom's story, and and a little history up in there. I'm gotcha. telling the story of my county where I grew up in. Mm. And the average person is not going to believe when they read this book and found out and find out that I lived on a plantation. Mm. And I'm reading a book right now called Slavery by Another Name. I, I got it from the MLK Memorial in Atlanta, and it's a guy stumbled upon some graves in the woods, I think in Alabama or somewhere, and he started to re, uh, to retrace these steps. And it talks a lot about where you're from um, and the history of slavery there and stuff like that. It's, it's crazy. I'm growing up, you know, as a kid, our governor name is George Wallace. Wow. And he the governor, and, you know, he's in Montgomery. Mm-hmm. And I'm... 20 miles away from him in Lowndes County, and my last name, Wallace. Mm. So, and he fought the hardest against change, you know, desegregating schools and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. So, right. I mean, and and during, during the process of the book, you know, I throw out a couple of names to the author, and she go research it and come back and be like, wow, Ben. Like, they did own slaves in your area. I was like, listen, I'm, I'm telling you. Yeah. Right. So you can research it. Because if I just tell you, you're not going to believe this story. Right. Yeah. And I told I lived in a slave quarter. And she asked me to explain what a slave quarter is. I say, the guy my brother and stepfather and worked for, he lived down the street in a big, beautiful house. I said, the house we lived in was a center block house. No insulation, no heat, no air, no indoor plumbing. Wow. And it was a row of them. Like, you might have four or five here. And on the other side of his house, you have four or five more. Yeah. I say, she said, you are describing the slave quarter. I was like, I lived it. You don't have to right. tell me. You ain't tell I, me. I, I, I lived it. So I'm like, my first job, I worked at a cotton field. Mm. So my legacy is is just it's it's different. But I try to tell people I'm not telling these stories for you to feel sorry for me. I'm not telling you these stories. So you can look at me like I'm better than what I am. I'm telling these stories because part of my lo- part of my legacy is going to be inspiring and motivating. Right. I'm telling you these stories from a motivational standpoint mm-hmm. that just because you start off bad, I hear a lot of people say I just played the hand I was dealt. But most of the time, one hand don't decide the game. Mm, yeah, true. You know Facts. what I mean? You've got to play multiple hands to decide the game. The hand I was dealt, the hand I started off with, I stayed in the game long enough until my hand improved. Mm. And once my hand improved, I became a winner because I stuck with it. I stuck with the grind, and I never lost track, and I never lost faith. 
and I never gave up. So motivation, inspiring, and just that ter- determination to go out and achieve your goals. So inspiration is my motive is, is is my legacy you know so when do uh when can people expect the book to come out oh man we probably go still got like another eight months it, the book would have been out <laughs> been busy the book would have been out but the book just keep taking on a, a life of his own a, a complete his life of his own you know I throw some out there you know they go research and they come back and was like how much do you know about this well I know this 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 and the third like we gotta put this in the book. We gotta put it in the book, and um, cause you know without giving away too much of the book, you know, um, I know y'all familiar with the Black Panthers. Yes. Mm-hmm. And the average person think the Black Panthers got started in Oakland, California. Yeah. Well, the Black Panther Panther did not get started in Oakland, California. Mm. The Black Panthers got started in Lowndes County, Alabama. Uh. So. Huey P. Newton had to come to Lowndes County to get permission to use the Black Panthers out there in Oakland, California. Wow! Mm. So, so we, so are you saying that we can get another interview when the book come out hey. and talk about just the book? Hey, everybody, I, I'm all spots. Everybody that's interviewing me now, when this book come out, you know you're gonna have to rebook it, and 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 we gotta talk. Well, we gonna about get with this. Trey, man. We yeah. we we'll have, you know, we'll do, man. We'll we'll, we'll get twenty or something. Make everybody buy a copy before they come in. Oh, yeah. Got yeah. to buy the book. And got to buy the book, and we could do a live, you know, just a discussion on it. Man. Yeah, I think that'd can, be great, man. We can do a we can do a read alone, like flip page, such <laughs> right. such. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey. yeah you, you, that, that'd be dope. We tell the audience to go to certain pages, and then we can explain man. to that. That'd see, Trey. You got to get it get man. It together, man. We we, we we got it on camera, man. We gonna bug it until we set this up when the book come out. Yeah, because um, you know, the true leader of the Black Panthers. Or the two founders of the Black Panthers was um, Stokely Carmichael's, yeah. and the Black Panther was born from the the march from Selma to Montgomery. Yes, which the majority of Black people think that people not that the um, Blacks in Al- in Alabama wanted that march to happen. The people in Lyons County did not want that march to happen, but Dr. King was insisting on having that march. So everybody that was from Lyons County when the march in Lowndes County, Stokely Carmichael pulled all of them out of that march. Anybody that had a resident in Lowndes County, he pulled them out and said, if y'all that passion about having rights and being free, y'all will need to sign up with me. So he pulled the Black Panthers, he plucked Panthers out of that march mm. and named them the Black Panthers. Mm. Wow. And started their own political party in Lowndes wow. County, Alabama. Wow, 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 man. This has been... I'm telling you, man, it's it's way more. It's yeah, it, way yeah, this, more. yeah, this, and I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you, man. Like the interview is taking on legs in multiple directions, man. This is a, you got a great story, man. Yeah. A great, it's great a story. movie. It's, it's it's a movie, man. You know, and I've been working on the movie too. And, and that's, let me get a little part in the movie. Little, that's little. all I need. So you could be the no, guy let when, dri- when let, me, they, let me drive a car or something in the movie. No, you would be the guy when they beat the Lakers. You just be in the bar putting your hands. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, you get a Lakers jersey on in Detroit. A light skin DJ, and when y'all when you dunk on Shaq, <laughs> DJ composition. Uh, I'd rather sad be in Laker the car. Fan. I'd I, rather I be in the car. I'd rather be. In you the can car. drive home. Oh. Whatever you want to do it you, when the Lakers lose. All right, so let everybody know how they can um support you. Rich got a question. Your favorite Kobe story? Oh, okay. I mean, like I said, my relationship with Kobe, you know, it, it was different. You know, on the floor, you know, he was a fierce competitor. I feel like I was a fierce competitor. You know, but um, I had respect for him and um, his, his goals and what he was trying to do. You know, um, he had mutual respect for me. But but the biggest thing is, as you know, and I posted on on, on my Instagram. You know, um, fear the fro was. It ain't so much, or how guys feel about me off the floor. Yeah. You respect me on the floor as a fierce competitor. Yeah. Who's who's out to win? Not gonna do anything dirty. Not gonna do anything crazy. But if the opportunity presents itself. 
I'm going to knock you on your ass like I know you're going to knock me on my ass. Yeah. But when we step off that floor, you don't have to utter not one word to me. And Kobe didn't talk to a lot of people. But what gave me the utmost respect for Kobe was when he came off the floor and he saw my kids and he took the time to talk with my kids. Mm. And, you know, on the court, it's all about me. Yeah. Off the floor, it's all about the set. I'm all about the family. Yeah. On the floor, I'm fighting for my job. I'm fighting for my reputation. I'm fighting for my team. I'm fighting for my city. Yeah. Off the floor, the only reason I need to raise my hand is to protect my family. Yeah. So for him to take the time and show love and respect to my kids and for my family, like I said, that's a class act that would never be forgotten no matter what sport or business you in. Yeah. No matter how much we go after each other and how bad we beat each other up, when you walk off that floor, it's about the family. Now, that's family time. And for him to talk to my kids and take pictures and stuff with the kids, like, like that's a class act. That's priceless. That go way far than me dunking on him and beating him for the championship. Yeah. So and, and that's been a common thing about a theme about his life. A lot of people coming out saying the things that he's done for children, for their children, because he was the face of a generation. Him and AI, you know, uh, taking the time out with other people, the families and and other teams, families and stuff like that. That's that's been a the theme, and that's made that made this whole situation just really really sad. So. Yeah, yeah, and then to see him lose, you know, his life, you know, as well as, you know, one of his daughter's yeah. life, man, you know, that's that's tragic, you know. Shout out to the to the um, to all nine people that tragically lost their life, but you know, I know sometimes we talk about Kobe and we talk about his daughter, and people think we forget about you know the, the other, other seven other, yeah. people, but you know, we we're not forgetting about those people. But these are people that we know personally. These are actually family members, you know that. That it's a brotherhood. We had, that we had a chance to actually grow up with. Yeah. Right. So, you know, it's a tragic accident, man. And, you know, it was it's a tragic death. And, you know, you don't, you, you hate to see, you know, your, your peers or, or, your, or your family go out like that. But, you know, I just, I appreciate all the love and respect that not just basketball is showing, but the world is grieving. Yeah, the entire yeah. nation is grieving. You know yeah. what I'm saying? People who not even really a basketball fan, they know the name Kobe Bryant. Yeah. Right. You know what I'm saying? Kobe Bryant rings with Michael Jordan. Yeah. You know, and LeBron James. Yeah. You know, he was he was a guy that when he came into the league, everybody said was cocky and arrogant and and this and that, and he's not gonna last long, this and yeah. that. Man, the man said he wanted to be the best. And he went for it. He had a goal. He, he had work. a goal. He, he, he put that work in. Yeah. And you can see his effect on the game through other guys that's playing the game now. Yeah, now, I think this story and you and this interview is also going to show, because like I said, you had the same grit and grind. It just wasn't publicized. You was you was in the dungeon, you was lifting weights, all that stuff. So um, we really appreciate you, man, taking the time off for us, man. Um, no it's, it's like you growing up watching basketball, man, just it's an honor uh, just uh, being from Michigan and just watching you guys from afar, man, and appreciating it. Um, so I just want to personally say thank you. No doubt, man. Appreciate it. Um, Wallace Motorsports, check them out. Get you, get in the game, get in the sport, get in the driving um, sport. The, the Grand Rapids Drive. Grand Rapids Drive. Um, anything. Book coming soon. Working on. We working, working on. on the book. Working on the movie. Um. February February twenty ninth. You said I got the. Oh, see you. Come on, man. You pointed out. I was gonna slide this in my coat, we man. Was, <laughs> I was gonna take this home, uh -huh, man. Uh -huh. So the, I'm holding the bobblehead for a, re a reason. Um, every year you do a, a bobblehead game. Um, last year we met Chauncey. So Chauncey also said, you know, Chauncey might say, yeah, whatever. I'm like, yeah, bro. You ever town, man? We get an interview. <laughs> oh yeah, I got you. You know. So we gonna hold you to that too, Chauncey. If Ben ever get you back here, but the bobblehead is from Ben Wallace bobblehead night. Fear the fro. Um. So yeah, I'm Trey. I'm 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 sliding off with this one. Big Let's, business Ben. Yeah, with that uh, with the <laughs> with the uh, <laughs> with the bobblehead. You know, I mean, we decided to do something a little bit different, man. Because you know, I want to say this before we before we go. You know, um, shout out to all the 
professional athlete that turned businessman yeah. who made the transition because it's not an easy transition, man. And uh, a lot of our guys don't make the transition. Yeah. And they get stuck in that in between, mm. and you know, and and it, and it and it's tragic to see. You know, I I saw one of my brothers that I played with in Cleveland. You know, on the street. You know, homeless. You know, getting beat down in the street. Yeah. And um, you know, shout out to Delonte West, man. This mental health issue thing, man, it's it's serious. Yes. Right. You know, I mean, first it start off with depression, then it lead to something different. Yeah. And you know, I mean, for anybody, if you know one of these professional athletes come, you know, knocking on your door, man, you know, I, man, give them a shot, man. Take them serious. At least hear what they got to say, man, because. Yeah. You know we human too, man. You know, absolutely. The money that we make, we make it. We made it because we earned the right to be called the best in the business. You yeah. know, but basketball is what we do. That's not who we are. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, everybody got to make that transition, or or our guys gonna continue to suffer. And that's why the Ben Wallace bobblehead is in the suit and the briefcase. And and I guess and that's a common theme, man. Going to work. Going now, to we're work. Talking about going a little bit. Work. The, the spray paint, you guys really cultivated um, a mood and uh, and you kind of captured that Detroit grind, that built for tough. Mm -hmm. Your favorite car is a Ford. You end up in Detroit, man. You bring Not a the ring. Impala, though. The Impala is a Chevy. The, the, yeah, I mean, the Impala is a Chevy, but you know, I just built, want to make sure you get to I, I know the difference. <laughs> but you built for tough and, 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 and you guys kind of, you, you, you had a working class team, man, like you and. Rasheed, like the Wallaces, man. You and Rasheed Wallace, man. Yeah. Like, like that's like that stuff. Like the way that team is put together. Rip, um, with the mask. Uh, Chauncey, Mr. Big Shot. Tayshawn with the block. You guys had your own separate things. Ball don't lie. All that the fro. Mm -hmm. And you guys put all that together, man. Um, and, and again, it was a pleasure, man. Like, it was a pleasure watching that, man. And I, we probably need a part two because I got a hundred questions in my head. I want to <laughs> ask, but I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna hold y'all up, Trey. You know, I'm, I'm, we we get a part two, man. And um, you're always welcome, man. And, and uh, again, I got more car questions. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got more questions, more car questions. I know it's more life questions, man, because you have a, a vast amount of wealth, man, and knowledge. So, man, I mean, that's just two things that I'm passionate about: cars and basketball. Yeah, we can. You know, we can definitely set up. Um, a second interview, man. We are uh, and go see. The, okay, so you hear that? We gonna. I'm, I'm, I got you, man. On these recordings, man. Yeah. Rich recorder, all this. <laughs> and when bro. the season kick off, I'm I'm gonna come check out the cars when the season kick off. Man, can't wait, dog. Like I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, you will be surprised. Or the energy and effort that goes into these cars. The effort alone, I know, is crazy. Yeah, it's, I mean, like if I was looking crazy. at the chassis, it just the the suspension components. I mean, even the tires. I was looking at the tires. I was like, man, it's a seven hundred dollar motor, man. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I know cats with old schools ain't got a seven hundred dollar right, motor. Right, right. They hey, they got a three hundred dollar car. A three hundred dollar car, <laughs> man. This man. the car's got stickers with, with beats in it. Okay, another question. <laughs> How I know when you on NASCAR to put the stickers on the car costs. Does it cost a lot of money to get a sticker on that uh on like on on one of your race cars? Um, no, not really with the sticker. It, it usually, if um, if you buy, you know, um, any product from me, yeah, you know, I'm a I'm gonna throw some stickers in there with it, like, hey, put that on the car. These stickers on your car, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So we, you throw we, these stickers on your car, you know, I give you a, you know, ten fifteen percent discount on, on your okay, you know what I'm saying? So that's how, that's how it work. You, you get you get sponsorships, if you know. Um, some drivers get full sponsorship where they don't have to pay for anything, you know. So they basically getting paid to just drive these cars, put this sticker on there, whatever, whatever. And, you know, and, and some drivers get discounts, you know, just by driving certain brand cars and putting certain stickers on there or whatever. But, you know, everybody that I work with in, in, uh, in, the, RC, uh, in the RC industry, you know, I, I make sure when – when I'm driving my car, I make sure I got their stick on there. Okay, you know gotcha. I mean? so Show it's just about the support, just showing. Yeah, up. so that, so now we we get some some uh, Wallace Motorsports merch. We'll put it on the show, man. You sponsor the show, man. We need uh, two drive tickets, a signed jersey, and a basketball, Listen, man. I just need help <laughs> tuning my car, man. I, I got a car, I got an entry level car. Mine's ain't as nice as I got an entry level joint. So I'm what hey. off camera. We gonna talk about that. So, yeah, yeah, whenever yeah. you ready to step out there, just let me know, man. I put a package together for All you, right. man. We get you out there. Cool. I can't wait. Take my take my shorties with me. 
Okay. It'll be all good. Well, once again, thank you for all your time, man. Uh, love hearing these stories, getting your experiences, man. And we appreciate everybody who support Two Bright Guys, support The Drive, Wallace Motorsports, Ben Wallace. Um, we'll have all the other information on our website, on our uh, social media stuff. So if you haven't. Give me your social media real quick as well. Fear the Fro. Fear the Fro on Instagram? On Instagram. Um, and Wallace Motorsports on Instagram as well. Fear the Fro on Instagram. Wallace Motorsport on Instagram. And um, and Fear the Fro and Wallace Motorsports on Facebook as well. Okay. Simple as that. So I'm DJ Composition. I am still the youngest of the OGs, man. Oh, yeah. AKA Just G. No, no, no. And we want to thank our guest, Ben. And we out, y'all. Y'all rich. Hey, thanks, hey. man. And that bobblehead has disappeared, bro. I don't know where it went to, man. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. I'm getting another one at the door, too.